Welcome to uh, the primary forum uh, focused on the uh, U.S. House of Representatives seat being vacated by Peter Wells. Um, the candidates here tonight, they're not the only candidates, but the candidates here tonight are Becca Ballant, uh, Dr. Lewis Myers, Molly Gray, and Liam Madden. And they all uh, are happy to be here, I think. We'll find out. <laughs> After the fact, we'll see how they vote, whether they'll come back some other time. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions to start, but then we're going to open it up and we have a, a mic and somebody who will wander around with a mic for any, any questions from the audience. The rules will be the same, whether it's my question or somebody from the audience, which is two minutes to respond to the question. Uh, there can be rebuttal or follow-up. If there is, uh, the, the follow-up from me, if I ask, like, you don't answer the question, I'm gonna ask again. <laughs> and that's a minute and a half. Uh, Jacqueline's gonna keep time, and she'll hold up a, a, a sheet of paper, so keep your eyes on that, it'll give you a, It'll be a minute and 30 seconds, a minute, 30 seconds, and 10 seconds. And then when you hit time, that's... Nice. That's, that's very pleasant. That's better the than end. The, okay. yeah. better and than and the it'll buzzer. be hard to talk over. So <laughs> that was the goal. Uh, and I think the, the, the response times for everybody on the same, on the questions from the audience or for me are the same. Uh, you can... Uh, uh, have rebuttals okay, but that's going to come off your time in response to the next question, uh, just so you know in advance. So we'll have to sort of keep score on that. We, and we may get it right, we may get it wrong, but uh, whatever. We're not professionals. We're all amateurs at this. Uh, anything else to start? Let, let me throw out the first question. There is a significant controversy regarding the Supreme Court and its recent rulings regarding abortion, separation of church and state, executive branch freedom to regulate uh, climate control, uh, gun control. And what I'd really like to hear is your point of view regarding actions, if any, that should come from Congress. And you can respond either on the specific issues uh, that the court has ruled on, or on the court itself, and how it is how it is structured and how we're dealing with it. Obviously, it's been a debate, uh, and I'd like you to be as specific as you can in what those things that you recommend. We're going to start uh, and go left to right with the first question. The next question, we're still going to go left to right, but I'll start with with Lewis rather than Becca, and we'll just go through the rotation that way, if that's okay. So Becca, if you wanna fire away. All right, uh, good evening. I'm Becca Ballant, for those of you who don't know me, and um, I wanna start by just saying it's really nice to be in Ludlow. I used to direct a camp up in Mount Holly and spend a lot of time here in Ludlow. So yes, there's a lot of concern right now about the Supreme Court and the recent ruling regarding Roe. Of course, uh, in terms of congressional action, I think we absolutely need to codify Roe and we need to deal with the Hyde Amendment that's been preventing uh, women on fixed incomes, low income uh, women across this country from um, accessing reproductive services. But to your question, what should we do about the Supreme Court? I think it's clear that Congress should use the authority that it has to enact some reforms of the court. I'm very interested in looking at term limits for Supreme Court justices. So when you look at how many years a Supreme Court justice used to serve several decades ago, it served about 15 years on the court. Younger and younger people are getting appointed and they're staying on the court for over a quarter of a century, sometimes longer. I don't think that's healthy for democracy. We also have a problem right now with something called the shadow court which is the emergency docket that, again, used to only be used um, from time to time. Now it's used pretty regularly, and we don't get to see 
the decisions as the justices contemplate in them. They don't have to have written decisions for those. So we can put limits on what can be taken up in the shadow docket. I'd also like to investigate the, the issue of insisting on a supermajority on the court for overturning precedent. And I think you know, a lot of people are wondering why we can't even have the conversation about whether we should add more justices to the court. I don't know if that's the right way to go, but I sure think that we should have that conversation, especially given the fact that a majority of these justices were appointed by presidents who did not win the popular vote. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, can I get a pen for you and a piece oh, of paper sure. too, by the way? I thought Absolutely. we might have some here and I didn't bring mine in. Yes, that'd be great. Hi, thanks. I'm uh, Dr. Lewis Myers. I'm uh, actually work just up the road. Thanks, Molly. I just work just up the road uh, as one of the hospital doctors at Rutland Regional, and I've been up there just over nine years. So it's possible I've seen some of you up there. Uh, I share the concerns, I think, of all of us here, uh, at least at this, thing, at this um, platform tonight, about what's happening in the Supreme Court. Um, some of it has to do with simply the failure of Congress to pass legislation. Uh, it is opening up a vacuum that the courts are now filling, uh, first lower courts and then up, the, uh, up the, uh, the ladder to the Supreme Court. So some of this is a result of Congress not doing its job or not able to do its job to legislate. Um, I, I, don't, I, I support term limits among, for the Supreme Court justice at this point, and I think that's would get bipartisan support uh, among Congress and among much of the American people at this point. I don't think there's anyone would, would want to see Supreme Court justices, for example, in their 80s and 90s still he actively hearing cases. It's a tough job, uh, and you have to uh, be at the top of your game in your Supreme Court justice. Um, I would support the same limits, by the way, for federal prosecutors who have tremendous power and also currently have lifetime uh, appointments. Um, within each of the categories that Mr. Allen mentioned, I think there are way, things that we can do, uh, particularly if the Democrats are able to hold on to control of the House and uh, at least nominal control of the Senate uh, in terms of gun control, in terms of reproductive rights, in terms of the environment. Um, but we're going to have to uh, have a legislature that is going to maybe have to rethink how they go about it, maybe not go for the entire uh, tamale, as it were, but start to break it down and, and piece by piece make some improvements. Good evening. Thank you, Liz. Go ahead, Molly. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here this evening in Ludlow. Uh, there was a beautiful rainbow on the way in, which I thought was auspicious in a way. Um, hopeful signs ahead for democracy and, and for Vermont. Uh, what was deeply concerning to me as a lawyer, I went to Vermont Law School. I worked in Congress for about a half decade, then came home to the state because I was sick of taking lawyers to meet with the lawyers um, and really wanted to have the experience and understanding of our Constitution, of civil rights and human rights. Um, I clerked for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals for our Vermont judge, Peter Hall, um, up in Rutland, the late Peter Hall, and previously served as an assistant attorney general. And my biggest concern, seeing the Supreme Court the decisions one after another after another is first what comes next and I think we've seen uh, with Justice Thomas this isn't just about Roe this is about contraceptives this is about equal marriage it's about who you love and how you love so this court's just getting started uh, I think what separates or distinguishes my opinion um, perhaps from others here this evening is that I don't believe trying to spend a lot of time right now fixing the court fixes the problem, and I think the problem is Congress. That in the Senate, and I know we're running for the House, but in the Senate, the filibuster, I do believe, needs to be reformed or eliminated uh, so that when good legislation passes the House, it can get through the Senate, and that we have to prioritize codifying everything. The court is not supposed to be the one that's legislating. The legislature is supposed to legislate. So that's Roe, that's gun reform, that's the EPA and uh, making sure that the EPA has the climate authority that it needs. Um, it's all of the pieces of legislation that we need to protect fundamental rights in this country. Oh, I still have 30 seconds? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, I think I, I will leave it there, but I, what I want you to know is that I had the experience, and I think it's a moment right now that's really important. I know there's rooms where 
being a lawyer isn't that popular, but I think right now we need good lawyers um, really ready to uphold and protect the Constitution and uh, get to work to, to codify everything. Thanks. Liam? You know, some of our eyes are better than others. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Liam Madden. I probably had the shortest drive tonight. I come from uh, Bellas Falls, Rockingham area. I grew up around there. I grew up in Stowe and then Bellas Falls where I went to high school. So I um, actually worked in Ludlow today up on uh, Pond Road installing some solar panels and um, battery backup systems. So I, I'm from this area. I know it well and I appreciate you all for being here. Um, this is an excellent question because I, I believe it gives us the opportunity to go in several directions that are all important and touch on a lot of, a lot of subjects. The Roe v. Wade, I think, deserves a little bit of attention uh, just on the issue itself before we talk about how the, the court as a whole functions. Um, I am pro-choice, um, but to me, there is ground to stand on for someone to say that there is legal and moral complexity around when uh, there are two lives instead of one at play. And I would be strongly for protecting someone's right of autonomy over their own body um, through certainly the first half of pregnancy. Um, and I think most people are kind of morally repulsed by the idea of a nine-month-old being aborted for a frivolous reason. And I think there's, there's grounds to have states hash that out. Um, but as it relates to the courts, I am, I am disturbed in the direction of the court and I believe there's three ways to fix it. You can either fix it with a constitutional amendment, you can fix it with legislation through Congress, or you can fix it through reforming the court itself. In Roe v. Wade, my highest ideal would be to have a constitutional amendment that protected people's fundamental rights to govern their own bodies and reproduction. However, um, that's a big reach. Legislation, as Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg uh, articulated, is the way to protect uh, the rights afforded through Roe v. Wade. Um, and reforming the court is actually my least um, favorable option there. I think it's, it's the hardest to achieve, but if there was one element there that I, I think would be worth pursuing, it would be term limits and possibly impeachment for justices that lied during their hearings. Thank you all. Thank you all. Those were thoughtful answers, and uh, I won't say what I believe. But <laughs> <laughs> Because that's may not I, my job. May I ask a clarifying question? Of course. So in the next round, as you said, if you want to comment on something that someone else said, you can take part of your time at the Response top. Response time, okay. exactly. Thank you. Exactly. And, and actually, my next question, I'm going to change the order a little bit from what I intended because it's sort of a direct follow-on to the discussion about the court. On a whole wide range of issues, more than the ones the courts ruled on, voting processes and voting rights, uh, gun control, abortion, child care, family leave, and others. We're seeing a fundamental re-argument about national priorities and national action versus states' rights. And I really don't know, personally, how one should strike a balance between those two ideas. So I would like to know what you think. And if you happen to come down on the side of national action or national priorities, then I'd like to understand how you would protect states' rights and minority rights. And Lewis, we'll start with you, if, if that's OK. That is, uh, that is a terrific question. I think it's fair to say it's not one that's been asked in any of our forums or debates thus far, uh, but is a, a foundational question. Um, and I think it's going to be one that's going to continue to play out in, in the coming years. Um, our country is so divided right now, uh, and Congress is so dysfunctional, um, that it's difficult to see how any, almost any legislation that is going to affect the whole country is going to be um, accepted around the country without huge protests, either from the left or the right. So I think in that vacuum, we talked, I talked in the, my first response too again about the vacuum, but in that vacuum, that states' rights is, is increasing in importance. 
What concerns me is some of the more egregious examples, particularly coming out of Texas, where the Governor Abbott is, for example, taking on federal uh, responsibilities. The federal government is responsible for dealing with immigration, and he is taxing, uh, tasking his National Guard uh, and other uh, state, uh, state troops to, um, to address immigration. So I think that has to be stepped on, because uh, that's almost seditious at this point. Uh, we cannot have states taking on what is legally within the federal guidelines. But I think this debate will continue. I'm interested what the others have to say. Molly? Yeah, I remember going through law school and taking constitutional law, and we thought that right to abortion, a right to contraceptives, access, equal marriage, that those are fundamental rights, fundamental rights. It doesn't matter what your zip code is. doesn't matter what state you're in. Those belong to all of us. So certainly to see those rights now stripped away and to largely sort of hunt it back to the states is concerning. Um, I believe those are rights that have to be uh, equal no matter where you are in this country. What was really concerning, and I saw it as sort of a one-two punch with the Supreme Court's decision on guns, right, saying that states can't regulate um, guns in public spaces. And then the next day say, <laughs> but states can regulate when a woman can have a baby or a person can start a family, right? And that's perplexing, right? Why? That's a weird, I, I'm so curious what that analysis is as it applies to rights that are and are not for the states to decide. So um, I used to teach international human rights law at Vermont Law School and my document, the founding document was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and I believe that those rights, the, the most fundamental rights um, are those the ones that we need to preserve regardless of zip code, zip code. But then there's things around broadband and climate and workforce in areas where we need to have the flexibility of the state to invest and to address the needs that are particular to Vermont, which we have an aging state and, a, and a, a lot of needs. But those are different, and I don't believe that um, those are rights necessary that need to be legislated by Congress, but more giving states the support to meet the diversity of challenges they face. Thank you. Liam? So one of the wonderful features of our form of government is that states do exist and do have some autonomy to determine locally what is important for that culture, that set of values that predominates in those, those regions. And um, that creates a tension with, well, what is a right of an individual. And the states never have the right to dominate or, or abridge an actual right of an individual. So in my values, my framing, it, if you consider someone's autonomy over their body and their reproductive choices a right, there's clearly uh, some tension there. And I think I'm just trying to articulate where I'm coming from. I, I do think there's value in having states have rights. But I also think it's a clearly uh, the top, the paramount authority is the Constitution, which protects certain rights for individuals. Um, my big picture response to your, the root of your question, which has to do with national priorities and how we navigate this tension between how do we make decisions together? How do we collectively solve problems when there's more polarization and more um, chaos and, and strife among our, our governing processes. Um, I think the two-party system needs to be examined and thrown away. The two-party system drives us apart. It, uh, it makes it so elites control most of our pol politics and the, the media that goes around our politics. And it doesn't solve our problems. The proof is in the pudding. The two-party system is, has, there's not a lot of virtue <laughs> to it. And so if we don't create ways for the people to bypass politicians who aren't listening to the public, and I'm not talking about pie in the sky things, the majority of states have mechanisms for the people to get uh, their voices heard without being bottlenecked to a politician, then I think we're going to run into these problems over and over again. And we need to set priorities from the basis of the people. Back up. So I want to start off by just um, clarifying something that Mr. Madden said. There are no nine-month-old babies that are aborted for frivolous reasons. 
I worked on making sure that we could codify Roe v. Wade here in Vermont and making sure that we would have a constitutional amendment regarding reproductive liberty. And when you talk to doctors who actually perform any kind of reproductive surgery in the ninth month of a pregnancy, it's because the mother's life or the baby's life is in danger. Those are the only reasons that those happen. You have to go before an ethics committee in the hospital. So I just want to make sure we're clear about that. So to your question, I'm somebody that has lived this no man's land between states' rights and federal rights. So I first was able to get a civil union here in Vermont, and that didn't enable me to take advantage of my, my wife's uh, health insurance. And then we sort of upgraded, as it were, to a civil marriage, but still wasn't recognized outside of Vermont, and her family was in a Western state that was extremely LGBTQ, um, against LGBTQ rights. And every time that we wanted to travel with our children, we'd have to make sure we had all the documentation with us in case something happened there so that I could get to the hospital in case something happened to my child when I was out there. And so I strongly believe the federal government needs to be passing legislation that is codifying our basic human rights. And I'm very alarmed by the slide I feel like we're taking into theocracy in this country. I only have 30 seconds left, so I'll say it's not unique to this country. Um, Viktor Orban in Hungary earlier this week, um, very much trying to strip away rights from the LGBTQ community. So we are part of a global movement of autocrats, and we need to be clear-eyed about that, and we need to fight back. Very good. Well, let's dive a little deeper into that, this whole discussion and talk about the filibuster. Because ultimately, when, you, when push comes to shove, that's the reason, the principal reason why legislation has not worked for the last 20 years. Uh, maybe it's not 20, maybe it's more than that, but certainly at least 20. Uh, so we have a majority voting in a certain way, both at the presidential level and at, at the congressional level, but uh, not 60%. <laughs> and the Senate doesn't function. So what should we do? Molly, you want to take sure. that one? Yeah, and I don't think I'll take two minutes on this. I'll just be <laughs> really, really clear. Um, of course, the House doesn't have the filibuster. The House has the Rules Committee. Uh, when I uh, worked for Congress and Welch, helped elect him, I uh, was there when we started the office, and he was put on the Rules Committee. And we're like, what are we going to do for Vermont with the Rules Committee? But it turns out the Rules Committee is deeply, deeply important. It's where all legislation has to go before it goes uh, to the House floor. And it's um, the, the terms and limits of debate and what can be offered uh, helps guide um, how legislation will pass. The Senate has the filibuster. Uh, and because of the filibuster, we've seen major obstacles to important pieces of legislation um, like codifying Roe, uh, like Build Back Better, um, like childcare, you name it, not getting voting rights, not getting through the Senate. And so I believe there has to be a path where we reform the filibuster and figure out certain bills, uh, either policy bills or a certain percentage of support or we figure out how to ensure that the Senate has a rules committee and adopt that for that body as well. That's what I propose. Liam. I'm gonna take a moment to respond to uh, Becca. I agree with you, Becca. It is clear that well under 1% of abortions happen even in the last trimester, and because that is such a rare thing is why I'm comfortable um, saying states should have rights for later term abortions because it is so few abortions that are in that late term that have anything to do with uh, a frivolous decision, whatever that means. It, it would, almost all of these late term abortions are because of the health of the mother type of scenario. Um, but to a bigger point on that subject, if the middle 80% of this country was making decisions around this issue, we would be uh, probably pretty quickly able to agree that there's most people are fine with people having free access to abortions, first trimester, last trimester, 
um, probably only for the health of the mother, and there should be some autonomy for states to decide it in that gray area. I think that would probably settle the issue if we could get to a type of democratic functioning where the middle 80% of the population was actually the driver of policy. But because of the two-party system where we have primaries that drive people to appease the most polarized sections of their, their constituency, we don't get that. So we need to constantly remember that unless we have a foundational restructuring and technological innovation to how we solve problems together, we will keep running into this problem over and over and over again where it's difficult, nearly impossible to come to any sort of agreement and action taking in this country because of the, the structure of uh, the two-party system controlling our government. Um, regarding the filibuster, I, I would be happy to uh, vote against keeping the filibuster and my preference, though, would be to, as Thomas Jefferson said, return the safe depository of the ultimate power of society to the people themselves. And if we deem them not enlightened enough to wield that power wisely, then to not remedy, remedy it by taking their power from them, but instead educate them to make them be wise. And I want that kind of philosophy where the people have power and the wisdom and love necessary to govern that power with um, compassion. So human beings create governmental structures and we can change them if they're not working. And so I think it's clear when you look at the incredible dysfunction of the Senate, nothing is moving. The House functions in a much healthier way in terms of people truly having input into the legislation that is coming to the floor. So I would strongly support ending the filibuster. I think sometimes we forget that policies and procedures and protocols that are traditional but aren't serving us as a nation can change. We can change them and we should change them. Lewis? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I. Uh, agree with Ms. Gray, I would be more in terms of, uh, I would be more in support of reforming the filibuster than, than abolishing it. I'm not an American historian, but I do know that founders saw a different role for the House and the Senate. Uh, the House was the, the body of the people, it's elected every two years. Uh, the Senate was supposed to be the deliberative body, it's hard to describe them as deliberative at this point, but the <laughs> filibuster was intended to be part of that. that a uh, majority could not simply override uh, a minority uh, in terms of uh, pushing through legislation because they, it gave some voice to the minority. We have to remember that uh, less than a year from now, the Democrats may well be in the minority in the Senate. They may be in the minority in the House. And if we were to abolish the filibuster, that could uh, get ugly very quickly uh, in the hands of some of the Republicans. Um, for those of you who may remember 1964, how many remember the Civil Rights passage of the Civil Rights Act? Um, that went through a procedure. It went through the House uh, Rules Committee. Uh, there was a very arch conservative named Howard Smith there from Virginia. Uh, President Johnson did a little arm twisting, a little of the Johnson treatment, finally managed to get uh, the Civil Rights Act through the Rules Committee onto the floor of the House where it did pass. And then came the Senate, where Senator Dick Russell was waiting from Georgia, arch segregationist. Everett Dirksen was sort of the key vote in that. Um, President Johnson and Hubert Humphrey, again, they spent, I believe, 164 days of filibuster in the Senate, where people actually had to get up and talk, the Republicans, to block this. But it gave them, behind the scenes, the time to build the political momentum to pass the Civil Rights Act. Had, they, had there not been a filibuster, it might have just simply been voted down at that point. But having the time to create that movement across the country actually worked in the Democrats' favor. I think Lewis is a historian. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. That was uh, those were thoughtful answers on all on all counts. Although uh, I would ask Liam as a follow-up, uh, the evidence for direct democracy in California, for example, is not terribly good. Uh, in fact, it's pretty dysfunctional. Uh, just ask the school teachers who don't, can't get tax money raised 
to invest in schools. So I, take it a little further for me. Uh, well, for, for everyone's um, knowledge, there is a lot written on my website about this because it's, it's tough to cram into two minutes. But um, the, the Thomas Jefferson quote says a lot, I think. It's not just about giving people more power. It's also about creating avenues for them to cr come to better decisions together. And that is equally important. So that can be achieved because we have this incredible lever, thanks to technology, called social media. Social media, it will probably be recognized by historians as one of the most powerful things that happened to our society in hundreds of years. And that same power that is being used to completely polarize and create echo chambers, just like any technology, can be pointed in the opposite direction. The atom can be split to destroy the city or to power the city. That fundamental technology can, can be used in the opposite direction to create incredible social cohesion and adult education and to find ways that we share values and focus on those shared values. So it's not just give people more power, it's give people more power, wisdom, and love. Um, and one more thing about the filibuster, I would like to clarify that I would, only be for I would only be happy to end the filibuster in the context where there was other ways for uh, the people to end gridlock and to participate in democracy. I agree with Lewis that it, um, it, it is a protective measure to protect the rights of the minority. Okay. Does anybody else want to add anything on that particular topic of either direct democracy or filibuster? Or should we move on? What's the... Move on? Move on. Okay. Uh, we won't filibuster any longer. Anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Let's dive into a couple of very specific things and then I'm going to, one more question and then I'm going to see if anybody in the audience has things they want to ask. Uh, what specific proposals would you make or support regarding climate change, specifically vis-a-vis -vis the Green New Deal? Uh, and, and specifically to Vermont, how do you see climate change affecting Vermont? Uh, and I think we're starting with Liam on that question. Uh, a couple things you might want to know about my background. Um, I was a Marine who became the leader of the nation's largest anti-war organization, and after that, I became an entrepreneur and um, been focused on sustainability for most, most of my adult life after being a peace activist, and I uh, won MIT's Solve Award for Sustainability Innovations. I think one important thing is to focus the framing of this debate more on sustainability than just climate change, because the human civilization is not very sustainable for many, many reasons other than climate change, and climate change tends to be a divisive way to frame it. Um, things I would do around sustainability, um, first of all, recognize a very important fact that if we were to use this, uh, if we were to grow our economy at 3% a year for the next three decades, everybody says 3% a year is what we should shoot for, every economist, every politician, we will use the same amount of energy in the next three decades as we have in the last 10,000 years. You know why that's impossible? Because we only have 40 years of oil and gas left. And on the... Uh, Republicans don't really like to, to look that one square in the eyes, but what Democrats don't like to look square in the eyes is that the, uh, we don't have enough land to power our economy through renewables. Harvard professor David Key says it would take up to 72% of our land to power our, our, with wind, current wind and solar technology. So we need to think about how we power society and how energy and the economy are deeply related. Um, so what I'm basically saying is we need a complete paradigm shift in our economy because you can't have things that grow forever on a planet of finite resources. And if you're going to reinvent an economy, that's a big, complex, scary task. And you can't do that without a lot of buy-in from the public. So you probably need really strong, robust, new mechanisms that get public uh, trust and involvement in this process. So I'm saying we probably won't survive. We'll fly off an energy cliff unless we can create better governance mechanisms using structural change and technological change and change in mindset and worldview. Thank you. Becca. So we, as uh, I'm sure you all know, we are experiencing a climate crisis already. I don't know what it's like here in uh, Windsor County, but in Wyndham County, with every storm that hits now post-Irene, we see flooding in our low-lying areas. Uh, it's often the people with the fewest resources to be able to withstand the flooding. And so it's already here. So we need to have investments in um, reducing our, our fossil fuel consumption, but we also have to invest in resiliency for all of those people living in 
low-lying areas. And I just need to give a shout out to Dick McCormick out here who has been the champion of the, the, the need for climate action for years and years in the Senate. And um, one thing I want to say is that what I've noticed from traveling around the state talking about this issue is that a lot of people are feeling absolutely paralyzed. They care deeply and they don't know what to do. And they feel like we're being told that you as an individual can make significant change to um, address this issue. And we know that that is not true. We need federal investment. We need federal investment to continue in the weatherization program that we have here in Vermont for low and moderate incomes. We need federal investment to continue to reauthorize the uh, solar tax credit that we had that made it possible for so many Vermonters uh, to put solar panels um, on their, on their uh, I'm just waiting for the, the, the paper to flash at me. Um, the other thing I want to say is we actually need to address this um, for the agricultural and rural um, state that we are. So we should be rewarding farmers right now for all, of their doing, all that they're doing already for soil health, for sequestering, you know, sequestering carbon in the soil, for making sure that they have um, methods that they're using already on their, on their farms that we can give them incentives instead of shaming them for not being up to speed on um, the latest technology related to, to climate change. Lewis. Well, thank you. Uh, we have talked a few moments ago about the uh, state and federal, uh, what comes under state and what comes under federal uh, responsibilities. I would agree with uh, Senator Ballant. This is going to have to be essentially a federal uh, responsibility. Uh, the states simply do not have the money and in some cases the manpower and, or expertise to uh, make the kind of profound changes that are needed. Um, so I hope the federal government is, um, under this president, I think is taking it quite seriously. The problem is that our administration changes sometimes every four years and we see this huge shift. I had friends working in the EPA under actually George W. Bush, they were told to come to work and not do, any, do anything, literally sit at their desk. And it was just horribly frustrating for them because they were such committed people. Um, there are some things we can do. I support all of the different kinds of uh, uh, renewables. I also support nuclear power, and I, I may be the only one up here uh, to support nuclear power. It's 30% of our energy in the United States. Uh, and it's getting safer and less expensive all the time with the new developments. Um, I think we can focus money on the states where the change really needs to occur. And again, I'll go back to Lyndon Johnson. He knew how to twist arms. Lyndon Johnson would probably go into West Virginia and he'd pull Joe Manchin in his office and he'd be offering him a billion or two billion dollars to start converting these coal mines into renewable resource. Uh, he would use every resource available and it's gonna take that kind of effort and uh, coming from the White House as well. And finally, uh, we need to look at internationally. Um, we can't just try and fix the problem here. There's an article in the New York Times this week about the Congo, where people are going out every day and collecting twigs. They're deforesting the Congo Basin, the, the Amazon Basin, uh, by, because they need that wood to burn their fuel. So international too. There's so much to say. I grew up on a vegetable and dairy farm. There's not a summer season day that goes by right now where my folks and my brothers aren't trying to figure out, is it going to rain today? Is it not going to rain today? How hot is it going to be? We're feeling that, right? We're all feeling that in our communities. We're seeing more tick-borne illness. Um, it's impacting our winters, um, everything we know and love in the state. I want to approach the response, though, through three levels, the local, uh, national, and also the international. At the local level, as a state, we should be deeply proud of what we've done to build the infrastructure to weatherize homes. We have a lot of great programs through Efficiency Vermont to get more heat pumps into homes and to also support more and more Vermonters getting into electric vehicles and accessing electric vehicle charging stations. Our challenge is that we do not have the tax base as a small rural state to really make the investments. So that's where the federal government comes in. Peter Welch serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee. No freshman Congress person gets to decide their committee, but if I get to carry the mantle, that's where I'd like to be. Um, and that means making sure that we have uh, 
investments to supercharge the programs that we have, that we're growing the workforce because solar is not going to deploy itself, electric vehicles aren't going to um, take care of themselves, um, we're not going to weatherize our homes on our own, so we know we have to have a climate workforce. So support through the, for our trade schools um, uh, and getting our next generation into high demand sectors. And then we of course have to end fossil fuel subsidies and make sure that we are signaling to Americans that this transition is happening, it's gonna happen now, and we're gonna do it as equitably as possible. Which brings me to the international level. We can't show up with the Paris Agreement at one moment and then leave and walk away at the next. We have to show up every single time with the Paris Agreement, with international partners, because what's happening in Europe right now also impacts us. Can we go back to one question that uh, Lewis raised, which is specifically nuclear power? And I'd very quickly go through, starting with Becca, do you support a regeneration of nuclear power in the United States and in Vermont? As someone who represents Wyndham County, and we are still sitting with all of the spent fuel rods from Vermont Yankee, and we have nowhere for it to go, I will say no. So I will tell you, my 14-year-old son strongly disagrees with me, so. <laughs> Lewis, I think we know where yeah. you are, right. I don't. I believe we have a lot of other resources that we need to be exploring now that don't have the harmful, um, what do I call it, side effects, if you will, right? The harmful extra extras, and um, solar, I think, is our greatest uh, focus uh, right now. Finland just finished their long-term storage facility, and they are starting to activate it as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the fact that we can't do anything about the, the spent is, is a legislative problem again, mm -hmm. not a technical problem, right. just to be very clear. Uh, to be most upfront, I think not only do we need nuclear power, it needs to be the majority of our energy source into the future. I think geothermal would be my second choice, but that is at a, uh, a pretty infant stage technologically. To your point, I really want to reemphasize, not only is it just a legislative issue about what this, uh, the problem of waste, but imagine if we could have 95% less waste because we recycle the fuel. The only reason the United States doesn't do that, and other countries do, is because of a legislative issue. So I, I believe nuclear power needs to be, of existing technologies, the, uh, the backbone, and a lot of people from the era when nuclear power was dangerous are kind of gripping white knuckle onto the idea that it's more dangerous and it's weaponizable. If you use thorium as a fuel instead of uranium, it becomes a lot, uh, a lot of those negative side effects go away. All right, let's see what questions we might have in the audience. And if you don't have any, I have more, so I can keep <laughs> going. But uh, let's give everybody sitting out there a chance. And we have a microphone, and uh, we would like you to use it so they could, we can capture the question and everybody can hear it in, throughout the room. So just raise your hand, and uh, George will bring the microphone around. I am ready. We got a question. Okay. All right. Uh, I was just uh, wanting to hear. I was wondering uh, what your response is, or if you had any vision around artificial intelligence and its impact on the economy and the workforce and what your vision for uh, responding to that is and uh, shaping it, limiting it, et cetera. Louis, do you want to go first? <laughs> Two minutes. Well, I, I, uh, I'm the oldest person up here, so I, I uh, did not grow up with as much artificial intelligence. I had to rely on some of my own. Um, limited that that may be. <laughs> But um, no, I, I think it's a cutting edge sword. I, I, we're going to have artificial intelligence. It's going to almost certainly, it, it will increase in our society. I, I do have some concerns about uh, the uses to which it's gonna be put. We can look at some of the totalitarian societies and see that artificial intelligence is used to actually keep a society in check and to uh, continue and to create human rights abuses. 
there all, uh, there, I think there's also times artificial intelligence separates us as you, from other human beings and isolates us. But at the other end of the spectrum, it brings up great possibilities of um, making life easier in many ways uh, and uh, all sorts of new discoveries, whether it's in the biotechnology industry, uh, automotive industry. Um, so it's a future that uh, our children and grandchildren are going to uh, see in real time and live with. Molly, go ahead. Yeah, really interesting question. This hasn't come up during any debates, but it's a huge area where Congress has to provide some guidance. And there's so much we don't know. I mean, I think it should be subject of number of hearings um, if it hasn't been already. <laughs> Certainly, as uh, Lewis said, um, our kids are thinking about it all the time. I have an, a, a step 11 and 13 year old, 12 and 13 year olds, and they talk about AI all the time. And they know so much more than we do. Uh, I think the concerns as a human rights lawyer, are right to privacy, what data is being shared, um, how do you apply rights to AI, is there applicability in some way? Um, and again, how do we regulate that? So I don't know if there's a task force or a commission, but it's an area where, and I would add on um, with social media, with what we're seeing across the digital space, which is a bit different, just the deep, deep need for further regulation and understanding and recognizing what is the state's role um, to make sure that we have a framework moving forward. Thank you, Molly. Liam? I'm so grateful you asked this question. This is actually one of the motivators for why I run for office, is because there are questions like this that never get any time of day. And in, in fact, government not only, the technology is advancing so quickly that regulations aren't not, not only not keeping up with the technology, they're, they're not even aware that there's regulation needed. And I mean, I, I probably sound like a broken record, right? Like, unless we can technologically innovate and restructure our government to be able to see the problems, we're never actually going to solve the problems. Um, artificial intelligence has the potential, just like any technology, but this is an exceptionally powerful technology, to reshape the human experience and to completely change the trajectory of history. And it, it matters greatly who wields that power. And as of right now, um, there's two forces in the world getting close to artificial intelligence. On the one hand, it's authoritarian nation states around the world, and the other hand is tech oligarchs right here at home. Both of those are unaccountable bodies. Unless we have open societies embracing technology and how to use this, uh, the future is going to be authoritarian, either tech feudalism on the one hand or authoritarian nation states on the other. So if we don't reinvent democracy, we're going to have a either a feudalism or a United States not being able to keep up with authoritarian nations who have the power of gods. We already have the power of gods thanks to this technology and others, but if we do not have the wisdom and love of gods, we will destroy ourselves. And this is the motivation of me running for office. Becca. It's interesting going last on this question because there were so many um, really important points that each of the candidates brought up. Um, like. Dr. Myers and um, Liam thinking specifically about um, autocrats, thinking about how um, AI is used to track people and thinking about my family history. My paternal grandfather was killed in the Holocaust, was absolutely brought up in my home with the sense that democracies don't fail overnight. It happens little by little as rights are being stripped away, as people lose their privacy and so I have strong concerns about that. I also know I visited uh, the generator space in Burlington the other day, which is a maker space, and talked to someone there who was using AI for creating beautiful art. And so it is um, something that we have to be incredibly wary of. What, what uses are we putting it to? Where I have the greatest concern is that we don't even have a US Senate right now that can hold meaningful hearings on social media and the dangerous uh, algorithms that are used. So many of the people asking the questions didn't even understand the technology. So I know that we need more regulations in this field and I worry that we're not up, up to snuff to be able to pass the regulations needed. So a lot of the same concerns that Liam has. Thank you, okay. Another question from the audience? Yes. George? Uh, 
Um, I was wondering uh, if what your thoughts are about Bitcoin, if you think it should be regulated, if it should be legislated, or what should be done with it. Let's start with, I lost track of where we are. I think it's Mala. <laughs> I think it should be highly regulated, and I don't think um, it's another area where uh, the Bitcoin universe and the wealth and the players, um, it's not clear who they are, it's not clear how it necessarily works, and Congress isn't doing its part. I think that there's much, much more um, we can do. And we've also seen Bitcoin uh, starting to participate in politics, and there's Bitcoin millionaires in this country who have set up super PACs. And who are playing in races, dumping money into the Oregon um, congressional races, for example. So uh, it's a huge concern. It's a huge concern to me personally, and I think it's a, something that we absolutely have to get under control. Liam. I don't understand Bitcoin well enough to really give you an informed decision on how I would respond to it, but I believe that um, As of right now, I'm not inclined to regulate it. I'm inclined to learn a lot more about it. However, the underlying technology of Bitcoin is something called blockchain ledgers, and that is very important. And that can make corruption, as we know it, nearly impossible by making government contractors uh, transparent with how they spend their money and, and who, who funded them. Um, could you imagine that Raytheon and Northrop Grumman and these organizations that used to build rockets for NASA and the defense industry, when, um, when Tesla came along, they could underbid them by you know, a hundredfold. So Northrop Grumman and Raytheon were charging a hundred to a thousand times more than their cost of goods to the defense industry and to the sp uh, space industry. Um, and the government was happily paying it. Do you think that would happen with a blockchain ledger where you could see that that was happening? Probably not. So, I don't understand Bitcoin well enough, but I understand that using this technology can be a profound benefit to, um, to society and that you know, everyone should be for that, right? That, that is kind of a transcendent issue between left and right that you, slashing the military budget or increasing the military budget, well, how about we just have a, a better military because we're not feeding bloat from uh, grifters and, and people exploiting a very non-transparent um, bidding co contest. Becca. So I want to give another shout out to one of your senators, Senator Allison Clarkson, uh, who's not here tonight, but she and I worked on the first blockchain ledger legislation that we passed here in Vermont. Um, and as um, Liam said, it is an important tool for making sure that documents are not corruptible. So in that way, it is a very useful tool. In terms of it being a currency that's, that's traded, I'm very concerned about, I believe it was El Salvador invested heavily in blockchain. Um, I spent some time living and working in El Salvador, and I know that that government is in a, a very tight situation right now um, financially because of the investments that were made. And I think to the point that others have made, so many people do not understand the technology, and so I'm very concerned when I see Bitcoin um, uh, machines here in Vermont already that people don't fully understand what it what it means so I do think we need more regulation and I think we all need a tutorial any of us who are serving in elected office need a tutorial on what it all means thank you Lewis. well I, I also don't really understand Bitcoin what I do know is it started uh, really as uh, narco traffickers using it and others criminals so that their money could not be traced um, I also know that the people that are going to are being hurt now, and it's hundreds of thousands of people, are people who really weren't educated about what Bitcoin was, and they are some of them are losing their entire savings. The Winklevosses, on the other hand, the billionaires who got in, you know helped start Facebook, are walking away with a huge profit. And this is what happens in this country and in the world when these things uh, come up before they are efficiently re efficiently regulated, which is that the. Uh, the, the swindlers and the shysters make the money and everybody else gets stuck with the bill. So I, abs I, uh, I know that Treasury Secretary Yellen is very concerned about this and as are a number of the senators and Congress people and I think they're going to move toward regulating uh, Bitcoin and not a minute too soon. Thank you. More questions from the audience? 
Hi. Um, I've voted in every election since 1972, and I'm pretty proud of that. And like many in this room, obviously. And I, I don't consider myself a Republican or a Democrat. I consider myself somebody who has always tried to vote for the best person for the job at the time, for the person who was going to represent the people. And how can each of you assure me that that's in the, your best interest, that you're going to represent the people and not special interests? Liam. Am I, am I first? Um, so there's a couple things that I want to say about that. For one, um, <laughs> there's, there's kind of a squabbling match in this race about where money is coming from. Um, and I think it's kind of a farce because whether or not it's from PACs or from whoever, it's clear that there's, the last time I checked, like 80% of the funds that um, some of these candidates have received were from people that could afford $1,000 to a political candidate, which is kind of telling you who they might be representing. Um, but also, around half of those 80% came from out-of-state out of um, donations. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to represent the people because I'm, I'm by far the most grassroots in my, in my uh, fundraising. But more importantly, more to the, the point you're making, the central focus of my candidacy is how do we create ways to bypass a politician you might not disagree with? Uh, and how do we improve the governing process in our country? Um, that is by far, if I could die on one hill uh, in my service in government, it would be how do I give more power to the people and have them exercise that power with more wisdom? Um, do I have a little bit more time? I have a whole minute left? Yeah. Let me ramble. No, um, I think, I'll, I think I'll, I'll yield. Cheers. I'm going, to take, I'm going to take just to my 10 seconds here. Also, how you can know is because in my life, I have demonstrated that I am willing to take incredible risks, not only for this country, but to stand up against our own government. I'm willing to take risks that are against my own self-interest. As someone who is in the Marine Corps, risked a treason sentence, risked uh, time in the brig, risked all of my benefits um, to stand up against a war that I thought was morally unjust. So I think you can trust someone when they've actually done it, right? We all think, oh, I never would have been the good German, but... You don't really know until you've been in those shoes and taken a risk that cost you or could cost you. So I know in my heart that I can represent people even when it's against my own self-interest. I really like this question a lot. I think it's on most people's minds right now as we travel around the state talking to voters. So before I was in public office, I was a public school teacher. I taught in four different rural schools here in Vermont. And that experience of being a teacher and understanding my students and their families really helped me to chart a course in the legislature of how best to support regular people who are just trying to make things work. I don't come from money. I don't come from um, political connections or power. Nobody in my family has ever run for office at any level. And I was drawn to service because of my deep commitment to those students and families who I worked with in those schools. The other thing that I want to say is, somebody said this to me the other night, and it's, it's fundamentally true. When you go through life as someone who's part of a marginalized community, right? So in my case, um, as, as a gay person growing up when there was a lot of homophobia, uh, my very first introduction to Vermont was having someone scratch the word dyke into the side of my car and having to have it repainted. But when that happens, you're bullying proof. People cannot bully you. You've seen it all. You've done it all. You've had to be scrappy every step of the way. And I am not easily intimidated. And I know who I am. Fundamentally, at my core, I know who I am, and that's what guides me. Lewis. Thank you. Well, I... Uh spent my career in medicine where we um, don't ask, or I certainly have never asked a patient whether they're a Democrat or Republican. If they tell me, oh, that's fine, but I, I've never asked. I'm reminded that when President Reagan was shot and was brought into my, uh, the ER where I went to, where I trained, and he looked up and the surgeon uh, said, are you a Republican? And he said, we're all Republicans today, Mr. President. So I think that Building trust is important in medicine. Uh, building trust is important in politics. And uh, the problem is, how are we going to build the trust back? 
Um, the polls clearly show that Americans don't trust Congress anymore, and obviously with some good reasons. Um, I believe you build it back with results. Uh, I think we're going to have to step by step uh, try and put aside some of the extreme politics, and my focus would be on getting some results done, getting some legislation passed that would make a difference in people's lives. I think that's the only way we're going to build back the trust in Congress and in some of our other institutions. Mom. I also really appreciate the question. and I think we have a whole forum on the question. That is the question. It's a question I guess asked every day. Why would you want to go to Congress? It's so broken. Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? Are you progressive? Where do you fall? What are you, right? We, not, we need to stop. I mean, we really need to stop with the name calling. In this race, I've been called a corporatist Democrat. I've been called a catastrophe. I mean, there's names every single day. And I, I know, having worked for Congress in Welch, we get one. We get one person to represent us in Congress. And you can't show up in Washington calling people names, trying to, um, I don't even know. You, you, can't, you just can't show up calling people names. You have to build the strongest coalitions as possible. You have to show up focusing on the issues. I always say you catch more bees with honey, but in our case, you catch more bees with maple syrup. And I remember Peter Welch brought a lot of maple syrup with him to Washington. Um, but I'll say this. You know, I am a little tired tonight, and I'm a little embarrassed to admit that. We have been going nonstop. And um, I'm not accepting any corporate PAC contributions. Um, every dollar that we raise comes from people, phone calls, conversations, and requests. But it is really hard in the state to run for office as a first-time candidate and also to have outside groups pour money into Vermont. And we're having a conversation here tonight. I'm asking you all to hire me. Um, but it's really, really tough when we have massive outside spending. And that's what's happening here. It's happening across the country. And I think we have to immediately work to reform that in Congress. I hope that we have campaigns in the future that last six weeks. We all get the same amount of money. And it's you all, we all make the very best case. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something I've been thinking a lot about. But I'm Molly Gray. I will always be Molly Gray. I know where I'm from. I know where I was born. I know the people I serve. And I know the work that I want to do for you all every single day. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> thank you all for being here, and thank you for being in public service and wanting to be in public service. No matter what we think or what we agree with or not, what you're doing is brave and important and helps all of us, and it's usually thankless, so <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Liam, I, have, I agree with a couple of things you said. I have a very big concern about something that you said, and I want to give you an opportunity to expound upon it. You had said, I believe, that you're okay with states regulating a woman's body because, in some cases, it's just a small percent. I believe if you look back on the tape, that's pretty much what you said. That scares me that you would not be in Congress and caring about every citizen, that you wouldn't care about uh, a small sampling of citizens in this United States, that you wouldn't care about women, and that you wouldn't care about someone who's not vulnerable. Second, related, um, does that mean that you're also okay if states don't let me marry my wife, don't let me adopt, uh, or any of the other things because LGBTQ is still a minority? Thank you. Thank you for that question, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to expound on it. Um, no, I'm not okay with states denying you the right to marry or uh, and I, and I would prefer to be in a state where we have said the right for a person to have autonomy over their own body is, is a right and is not abridged. Um, it's not just that it's a small percentage that makes me feel more comfortable saying that states can have some rights. It's also saying that that small percentage is um, it's pretty much all people who are it, I agree with Becca. It's a myth that there are people having abortions at the, the ninth month, right? So I do agree that it is the woman's right to choose when it is solely one body to have a choice over. 
at some point there does become two bodies. And I believe there is moral complexity. I do have some sympathy for people who, who feel deeply about this issue from the other side. It's not a position I agree with, but I, I have sympathy and I understand that at some point when it becomes two bodies and it's not, it has nothing to do with the right of, uh, of the health of the mother, which is a very tiny, tiny portion of people, that um, in order to navigate this area of complexity and to keep cohesiveness in our, in our society, that would be a compromise I would be willing to make because when it, become, when it comes to two bodies, there are two rights to consider there. And I don't think um, it's unreasonable to have a, a little sympathy and understanding for the, the logic that's being used by people on the right, that, that it is two lives. Um, so yeah, that's where I stand. I, I, I disagree with the framing that we're talking about, oh, it's just a small percentage, so I don't care. It's, that's part of the context. But really what I care about is at some point, it does become two lives. Uh -uh. Just. It's <laughs> a good tune. <laughs> <laughs> if there are more questions, that's great. But I would, I would encourage, not encourage, I would like not to have specific questions that are only answerable by one candidate. I should have announced that at the very beginning, but I really want questions that will can be addressed by all the candidates. Thank you. Yes, in the back. I read something today I read something today about uh, one of your uh, interest in what committee you might be put on and where you'd like to caucus. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I wonder if each of you has ideas about committees and caucusing, which I don't know a lot about how much choice you have, but it might say something about where you're interested. Really appreciate the question, and as um, Molly said earlier, those, whoever one of us makes it to Congress, we're not going to have a whole lot of choice on, on where we end up, because we will be the new folks coming in. Um, I've been a utility player in the Vermont State Senate, have served on a number of committees, and I found every one of them to be a committee that is important and does important work for Vermonters, so have been on education, institutions, um, appropriations, finance, uh, economic development, housing. And so I will take those interests with me um, and will be of use wherever I'm placed. My priority is to be on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the other uh, on financial services is, is the second one that I'm interested in. And I think what we all need to do as we think about this job is understand the lens through which we do our work has to be Vermonters back home. It has to be how are we going to make a difference in whatever committee we're on to impact the folks back home. Lewis. Uh, I also would like to be on the Energy and Commerce Committee in part because that's where much of the health care legislation goes through and, and that would be a, a big focus for me. And the other committee would be the Armed Services Committee. It's the hu largest part of our budget, I believe, and um, it also reflects our stance in the world. Uh, in, regarding the other countries and, and the war that we're essentially engaged in with Russia now and perhaps a future war with China. So how America will defend itself uh, and the other free countries in the world uh, in the years to come. But I think uh, Senator Ballant's comment is, is very appropriate. I don't think there's any committee or subcommittee in Congress when you get to that level that is not important and uh, relevant for Vermonters and, and for our country. With the diversity of Sorry. <laughs> With the diversity of challenges we face right now, we need leaders who are ready to serve wherever we're placed. Uh, certainly, I've worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross. I've worked overseas in Iraq and East Africa, Nigeria, the Congo. I've spent three and a half years as the ICRC's Congressional Affairs Lead, working with the House and Senate Armed Services, Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs. So we'll be ready. 
we will have a lot of tough foreign policy decisions ahead of us. We already do, but to do that work, if called, if necessary, if placed there. But my reason for running comes back to the needs in Vermont right now and knowing over the last two years in particular that some of the biggest investments we've been able to make as a state in housing, um, in workforce, have come through the great leadership, of course, that we have in the legislature, but the support we've received from our, our congressional delegation, the $2.7 billion we were able to get. And with Senator Leahy's departure, we're in for a rude awakening. But this does mean that right now, when it comes to housing, investments in water and sewer, first-time home buyer credits, in childcare, um, in major workforce development changes here in the state, we need leaders who are ready to get to go on financial services, which is where a lot of housing investments are made, um, energy and commerce, as I mentioned earlier, where Congressman Welch has provided uh, incredible leadership, especially nationally on energy efficiency, uh, making sure that I'd be ready to serve there. And of course, education and labor uh, for me would be really important. I care about workforce development. It's why I ran for lieutenant governor. And it's why, um, in large part right now, I'm running for Congress. Thank you. Liam? Uh, regarding my hill I die on, the agenda to rebirth democracy, I think uh, perhaps oversight and, and um, government, government reform would be an appropriate committee. Energy and commerce, one of my motivating factors is about solving that little pickle of a problem we have about not having enough energy to continue to have a, a growing economy. Armed services to be a, a stalwart for peace and skepticism of the military industrial complex and the intelligence community. Uh, and ways and means because you get a lot of power there and um, you get to, uh, to the point of who do you caucus with. Um, well, this is a question specifically for me because I'm an independent and um, I'm running in the Republican primary, by the way, but I, I am an independent. I would happily uh, decline the Republican Party's nomination if, if I should win the Republican nomination. But um, I would caucus with whichever party, if it was a close house, was willing to court me, um, because that gives us, as Vermonters, extraordinary leverage, uh, and court me with the most sincere, earnest interest in pursuing the agenda of rebirthing democracy. So um, that's, that's where I would kind of leverage the power of ways and means or leverage the power of um, the politics of Congress. Okay. Other questions from the audience? If not, I have a few more. There we go. Yes. of cannabis for medical and or adult. Thank you. Let's start with Lewis. Yeah, that's been a tough, tough uh, subject for me, as, particularly as a physician. Um, I suppose I've evolved. I, I uh, at this point, I would support federal approval so that we don't have all sorts of patchwork state laws so you can get locked up in one state and not in others. Um, and it would allow us to do some really effective good research on this because very little of it has been done thus far. It's been a, as a Schedule One drug, it's very hard to get the permits to do the research. I think what concerns me about cannabis, honestly, is echoes of what I heard as a um, medical student in the 1990s when we were being told by our uh, professors we respected uh, that we were under treating pain and that we were literally told that if you give someone morphine or op opioids they cannot get addicted if they're in pain they cannot get addicted so that's what we took out into the world we've seen the results of that in the last 20 years unfortunately and I think what I see in the field of cannabis in the popular magazines newspapers is that everything is about all the benefits and nothing yet about the potential downsides of cannabis. And with these high levels of THC, we're, I can tell you in the emergency room, we are seeing the downsides. So that doesn't get in the public eye as much. But I think if we make it, a federally approve it with regu strict regulations and allow research to proceed in a pace uh, and allow some good teaching in the medical schools uh, and, other, and nursing schools as well, that it will probably be a good step forward. Molly? 
I'm not opposed to legalization. It's certainly not my top priority and not something I would be advocating for as a top priority in Congress. You have to be really judicious with what you decide to take up as a top priority. Um, I do think we are in a very challenging place as a state where we're moving forward in a direction quite quickly, yet the federal government is behind us. Um, I previously served as an assistant attorney general. I, I know that we have U.S. attorneys who are, you know, U.S. attorneys worried and uh, AUSAs who are worried in the state you know, how to deal with these conflicts and laws. But specifically, even with our banking system right now, uh, the MORE Act in Congress is, is one that would allow um, banks to be able to hold money for those who are um, growing and selling cannabis here in the state. But right now, there's a lot of concerns. Banks don't want to do that, right? They don't have the federal backing and security. So there's a lot that we need to do at the federal level pretty quickly as we see states moving forward in this direction to support public safety, um, to support those who are moving in this, into the sector, into this industry to do so responsibly. But again, it's not a top priority, but it's one that we certainly have to address. William? I don't think anybody should be in prison because they use cannabis. Um, I think, you know, I believe strongly in autonomy of people to have a uh, choice over their own bodies. And I think of their own consciousness, too. And what, what you put into your own consciousness should not really be the government's concern, as long as you can do that responsibly and don't break any other real laws and don't harm people. Um, but I agree with, with Lewis that there are downsides, just like there are downsides to alcohol. Um, and we have to be really careful about that. I, I don't think you know, it's, it's a willy-nilly, um, you know, just com completely disregard that there could be consequences, particularly for young people. Um, and just like alcohol, there's regulation around that, but it's largely for adults who have autonomy over your own consciousness. I am a little bit concerned about legalization um, for, solely from the kind of selfish interest of defending Vermont growers. Um, I certainly don't want anybody to go to prison anywhere in the country because they use canna cannabis. But I also don't think it would be necessarily good for Vermont growers to have really abundant, cheap, um, oversupplies of cannabis entering our market and kind of crowding that out. So although I morally have no issue with legalizing cannabis and don't think anybody should be in prison for using it, I'm a little wary of what it would do to our economy and I would want to just selfishly as someone from Vermont to protect the growers and Vermont's interests, protect that. So I would be kind of cautious about how I approach it. Becca. I support federal legalization of cannabis and I just want to be clear, um, we actually haven't moved quickly in Vermont. It's been taking us eight years since we first took the, uh, the initial bill up for legalization of, of cannabis. So we have thousands of Vermonters, thousands, that use cannabis both recreationally and medicinally. We need to have a tax and regulate system. And it is coming up to speed, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, I certainly understand, um, Dr. Myers, your concerns about the high potency of cannabis and how that's changed over time. Um, but let's be clear, we have a problem with mass incarceration in this country because of a failed drug policy, a lot of it around how we treated people who had either used or possessed cannabis, and I think that needs to end. I think that's all I want to say. Oh, one more thing. Dr. Myers also said, and I agree with him, we need to take the handcuffs off around research and development mm. around cannabis. We haven't been able to do the research, and we, we need to be able to do that. Other questions from the other questions from the audience. I don't see it. Oh, Kevin. What proposals do you make to help the Let's start with Molly. How much time do we have? I mean. <laughs> As Lieutenant Governor, every, every week I receive letters from Vermonters who are on Social Security trying to live right now in a fixed income in the state where we're seeing fuel prices, food prices, housing costs going through the roof. Um, the trust fund is going to run out, and Congress isn't acting quickly enough to recognize that. Um, SSI reform, SSDI reform, deeply important to me, recognizing as an aging state that it impacts us more acutely. When it comes to, to Medicare, um, I absolutely support Medicare for all, but I'm quite pragmatic in recognizing that right now, if the Republicans take back the House, and let's hope that they don't, 
it's not going to be a question of do we have Medicare for all. They're going to be pushing for Medicare for none. So doing everything we can right now to protect the Affordable Care Act, to expand Medicare to cover dental and vision and hearing in the state, making sure that um, Medicare, the government, can negotiate prescription drug costs, which Republicans and Democrats agree on right now, so there's no reason not to move forward, and I hope that we see movement on that um, in the weeks ahead, hopefully in the Senate, but I think it is just another crisis, as you said, that's brewing, and that it impacts us in the state in a very, very significant way, given our, our small state budget as well. Liam. Another question about some foreseeable, predictable consequence of having a government that really can't solve any of the problems we care about. Um, hmm. <laughs> what should we do? <laughs> um, specifically to Medicare, um, so if we're going to replenish the, the funding, where do we get it from is the question. Um, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty straightforward that I am for funding an economy centered around human well-being. And if that means less money for the military, I'm okay with that. And if that means less money for um, Amazon, who didn't pay any corporate tax for years in a row, I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with um, taking funding from the fossil fuel industry and the pharmaceutical industry, who are having a pretty good go of it right now. So um, it's a pretty straightforward answer to your question. It's like, how, what do we do about it? Well, you would fund it, right? And I'm telling you where I would, fund, I would get those funds um, as equitably as possible. Um, but Molly's right, like you, you probably need to take concessions about well, what, can, what actually is possible in the near term versus what, what do we actually want to achieve. Um, the Prescription Drug Price Relief Act so that Americans don't pay twice as much for their prescription drugs as Canadians is probably a good place to start. Um, we've had a whole debate on, on healthcare and I heard something from Lewis that I would like to echo which is the, the healthcare pricing in our society is largely driven by local monopolies. And if we don't break that local monopoly function, then um, we're never really going to get anywhere, even with something like Medicare for All. All Medicare for All would do is just pay from public funds for people to go to private health care insurance, insurers or providers that are charging whatever they want, basically. So unless the government can get involved and actually provide the service at closer to the true cost of these services um, instead of the monopoly price, it doesn't matter if it's Medicare for All or, or any other scheme. Becca, go ahead. So I think I want to start with just saying um, the way that we treat seniors in this country is unconscionable. We have so many elders living in poverty here in Vermont and across the nation. And it doesn't have to be this way. We can allocate funds differently at, at the federal level in order to do that. And I also want to put a plug into, I say we go back to um, the tax structure under President Reagan, even if we went back to the tax structure under President Reagan, we would have the money to shore up Social Security and the money to make sure that we could provide long-term care for seniors. Um, and I don't want to forget that another piece of it was um, Medicare for All. I absolutely support Medicare for All, and I think that needs to include mental health care for all. We have an epidemic of loneliness among our seniors here in Vermont in other parts of the country, and Medicare for All needs to include comprehensive uh, mental health. Lewis. Well, it's, uh, from a historical, <clears throat> historical perspective, again, it's amazing to think that as fairly recently as 1965, there was no Medicare. And when uh, you left your job, or, or didn't, you had to rely on all of your own funds to pay for any health care. So obviously that was a huge change, but now Medicare is struggling. One of the concerns, and we've talked about this in, in uh, previous um, forums, is Medicare Advantage. Uh, and I think there's great concern that uh, Medicare Advantage is moving into the Medicare field. These are private companies that uh, negotiate with Medicare to basically set up HMOs and administer the Medicare program for them. And some of them are good, but some of them are not so good. And uh, there's relatively little regulation at this point on the ones that are not so good. Some of them are almost pure bait and switch. They'll get people signed up for a year. I was, I, I've been getting calls. I got a call from someone in India the other day, a young man with a very strong Indian accent. I'm sure he was from a call center in India trying to get me to sign up for Medicare Advantage. Um, 
we need to look carefully at that, uh, at what's happening with the Medicare Advantage uh, plans. I agree that we need to be able to negotiate prescription prices. Medicare can negotiate every other, and does every other product line that they pay for except for prescription drugs. And it, it makes absolutely no sense that they are not able to. And we're going to have to look at some of the programs that have expanded, uh, particularly SSI disability and hospice. The fastest growing uh, Medicare uh, line is hospice. And it's kind of a third rail of politics. Nobody wants to come out against uh, a, 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 a treatment that is helping people who are at the end of life. And yet there are uh, tons of for-profit hospices now that are just soaking the Medicare system. So there are a lot of things that we can do, and I, I know where the bodies are buried. <laughs> Molly, go ahead. Oh, I think I started. Oh, yeah. did you start? I did. I did. I'll get a little punchy <laughs> up here. It's <laughs> very hot. Yes. Okay. Other questions from the audience? Let, let me ask one more question, and then we're going to give each of you a couple of minutes to sort of wrap up and tell us why we should uh, support you. Uh, my last question is actually about housing, which we touched on a little bit. Obviously, affordable housing is a, an issue in Vermont, but it's also an issue nationally. And if you look around the world, it's actually a, a worldwide issue. And the real, what I'd like to hear you say is how you would propose to balance the need for housing and affordability with the legitimate desire for development control and environmental concerns that we're trying to manage. How do you balance it? That's the tough part. Liam, you want to start? So this is an issue that is, I mean, top of so many people's minds and it's so interconnected with a lot of other issues. You can't have a workforce before you have housing. You can't have a thriving economy until you have a workforce. Um, there's some things I, I think about it short term, mid term, long term. Short term in Vermont specifically, we have a lot of people who own second homes, Ludlow, tell me about it. Um, and they're Airbnb -ing, um, these otherwise you know, rentable or homes for regular people to come here and work. And if we don't regulate that in the short term, uh, we're not going to achieve anything in the short term. In, other areas of the country, it's not so much Airbnb, but it's huge private equity firms like BlackRock that are just buying up massive amounts of, of affordable housing and renting it back to people. So those are some of the things you can do in the short term is regulate those two specific industries. Uh, Midterm, we need to build more housing. There's no, there's no way around getting more affordable housing until you have more housing. And um, I think, you know, I would love to see that. My ideal would be to fund, instead of, uh, Instead of, well not, instead of a Marine Corps, in addition to a Marine Corps, we should have a building corps. There should be an avenue of service that young people can take to um, get some of the same benefits, the GI Bill benefit that paid for my education, through non-military means of service so to help build the housing that we need. Um, one way or another we need to build housing, that would be the way I would prefer to do it in the ideal. Uh, and long term, I think we should have the federal government be providing more 0% loans for housing for, um, for pretty much anybody that is contributing to society who participated in that kind of service program, specifically subsidizing people who are working in agriculture or in specific trades that are, that are uh, really needed here in Vermont, like in the building trades and energy. And um, I, yeah, I don't think we can really address the housing crisis and affordability crisis until we build more houses. Back up. So I uh, was the longest serving member of the Economic Development and Housing Committee in the, in the Senate and did a lot of work on housing investments here in Vermont. We've, we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars and even so, we still don't have the housing that we need. It was a crisis before the pandemic. It's even worse now with a lot of what I call either COVID refugees or climate refugees coming to Vermont. I know that's true in Wyndham County. But we do have smart growth principles by which we're investing in housing. So making sure we incentivize building in downtowns and village centers, uh, making sure we're investing in accessory dwelling units. So an additional unit that is attached to um, a home that's already existing. We have money that we've invested in the VHIP program, which is rehabbing uh, homes that exist. But we know that the level of investment that we need right now for towns like Ludlow and others who couldn't afford 
to do a water and sewer upgrade. Um, we had a huge federal investment after World War II. That's how the suburbs got built. And I'm not saying we should turn Vermont into a sea of suburbs. What I'm saying there was a, a sense at the federal level that we could provide most Americans with an affordable home. We have lost that focus. And I think young people right now who are burdened with so much student loan debt, and they feel like, I was just with friends uh, up in, in Burlington and they said, I don't know how my children and grandchildren are gonna be able to afford a house here. We need a federal, of invest, a federal investment to make it possible for us to build more housing. Um, do I have 30 seconds or am I done? The other thing that I wanna say, which is unpopular to say, but I think I need to say it, which is one of the things that it makes it very difficult to build housing in Vermont is that a project will get green-lighted and then everyone comes out to oppose it because it's either ruining their view or there's gonna to be too much traffic on the street. I hear that across the state. We need to come to terms with that. Well, I, uh, everyone who's spoken on this has, has said some interesting and helpful things to say. I think it's what has changed about the housing situation is that this used to be by coastal problem as recently as 10 or 15 years ago. People on the east and west coast, big cities, it was very expensive. Now it's extending throughout the entire country and it's happened seemingly so quickly. I mean, we see this in Vermont. People in Rutland can't, can't find homes who are working. Um, it, this along with childcare, some of the health care costs seem to be the big problems holding back our economy. People can't move anymore because they're afraid to leave the house they have because uh, they won't be able to afford to move. So. Where do we go from here? I think Ian had some terrific ideas. I, I, um, he mentioned a building core. I would call it a Marshall Plan. Uh, we, and I would echo some of what Senator Ballin said as well after World War II. We actually helped rebuild Europe, didn't we? Uh, Europe was in rubble. And uh, we helped rebuild that continent. Uh, and we did some of the same for our own country. So we're going to have to make this the priority. And uh, it's going to cost money, but I think it's going to pay for itself in the long run. Go ahead. There's so much that's been said that I agree with, and I think the biggest challenge is that two or three years ago, when we decided to pay people $10,000 to move to Vermont, all of our focus was on growing the workforce, and now it's like, wait, they want to come, and they want to come right now, but we don't have the housing. So we've got to fix that piece, um, but without having the workforce, we can't build the housing. Without having child care, we can't grow the workforce. Without having the workforce, we can't have the child care, and they are all interconnected. Um, I've talked a little bit earlier, and, and uh, Senator Ballant mentioned it as well. We do not have the money for water and sewer in our state budget. Without federal support, we cannot do it. Um, we don't have the funding right now to be able to renovate older homes, um, to look at our housing stock across the state and really figure out um, where we can expand, where we can build. How do we build up and not out? I don't think that land conservation, the environment, it shouldn't be an either or. Can we have houses or can we have land? There's a way for us, and we're doing it well here in Vermont to have both. And the federal government right now is our partner. It has to be there for us as we make sure that home ownership is a reality for the next generation, but also looking at the spectrum of need. Because it's not simply workforce housing. It's assisted in supporting living. It's housing for families. It's housing across the spectrum um, in the state. And I think if we figure out the housing piece with federal support, and we figure out the child care piece with federal support, and we figure out the workforce piece, we are going to see a different Vermont um, in the next decade. Thank you all. Let's give each of the candidates two minutes to sort of wrap up and make their pitch. Becca, let's start with you. Well, first of all, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I know you could be anywhere, and it's very important as a former civics and social studies teacher that people are involved in the democratic process, so thanks for being out here. Um, I think I wanna just start by saying, I do what I do because I love people. That is why I was a middle school teacher for so long. That is why I served in the legislature for eight years, because I care deeply about my community and the people in my community. And you have a very important choice ahead of you. 
And I think it's important, given this moment that we're in, that you send somebody that has legislative experience, not just because it's important to know how to work within a legislature, but it's important to have somebody who has been tested in the public eye. And I see Senator Nick is here as well. Thank you, Senator Nicka, for being here as well. When you serve on a select board or a school board or a development review board or in the House or the Senate or any other elected position in Vermont, you have to face the voters and you have to be able to explain to them why you voted the way you did and explain all the thought that went into it. So I've been tested. I have a record of achievement in the legislature that I'm proud of. And of course, it's not done alone. It's done with uh, so many of my colleagues. And my colleagues will tell you, I was elected to be the first ever president pro tem who is a woman here in Vermont because I'm willing to work with anyone of any political party, of any philosophy, if they're willing to work with me in good faith. Now, it is true, Congress is not Montpelier. We all know that, we see it on TV. But in this moment, when the democracy is at risk, I think it's fundamentally important to vote for somebody who's been tested and has the experience. Thank you. Lewis, go ahead. Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for being here. And I, I'm gonna say what I've said before in these forums, that, um, and I hope that, uh, that you can appreciate that we have uh, four good candidates up here. Um, in watching Vermont politics over the years, when there was no open seat, usually with Peter Welsh or uh, Patrick Leahy or Bernie Sanders would show up in a studio or one of these forums and he would either be sitting next to someone very extreme views or someone who looked like they just wandered in off the street. So I, I, I think that the fact that we have... They were all from Wyndham County. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fact that we have four and even more candidates who are not here tonight, uh, and Ms. Chase Clifford, who is not with us uh, in this campaign anymore, uh, bespeaks something about Vermont in this campaign. We're gonna be okay, whoever gets elected. Um, I have not served in a legislature. I know that there are many representatives in Congress who have not. Uh, what I have done is have a career in medicine and clinical medicine in uh, primary care in the hospital where Nearly every day, they've been involved in making life and death decisions with and for patients. That builds a certain toughness, as I have some other experiences in my life. And I can tell you that uh, a bully like Jim Jordan or a weasel like uh, Kevin McCarthy is, is not going to be a problem. Uh, I'm not backing down from them. And, you know, I will stand up for what I believe. I, I am a moderate Democrat. I don't think that's a bad word. I think it means that I'm going to be there to try and get some things done in the relatively short time I'm going to serve in Congress, try and get some results, try and make it better than when I came, and then turn it over to one of these younger people. Molly, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and um, thank you, Jocelyn, and it's wonderful to be here on this stage this evening. I just want to, I guess, end by saying how much I've enjoyed. We've all gotten to know each other pretty well, and I think it's pretty rare to have primaries or even elections across this country right now where candidates, we laugh, we joke. <laughs> um, I don't think there's been any, any tears, but it's been really special. And to have you all here tonight on a pretty warm night, um, sitting and listening and engaging and grilling us, I uh, greatly appreciate that. So I do believe and wouldn't be here if I didn't think I was the right person at the right time with the right experience to serve as Vermont's Congresswoman. It has been said, and I will say it again, that the legislature here in Montpelier isn't Congress, and Montpelier isn't Washington. And I know that because I've worked in both. Not only as your lieutenant governor serving statewide through this pandemic, serving as the president of the Senate, um, helping to navigate the legislature, helping to get COVID relief out the door, but also working in Washington for a half decade, not only with Congressman Welch, helping to set up and run his office the last time we had an open seat, um, working for the International Committee of the Red Cross with congressional committees and staff. I know also right now that not only do we need leaders who understand Congress, but we need leaders who understand the law, who can draw on a legal background and experience to make sure that we are upholding and protecting the Constitution right now and getting to work very quickly to codify just about everything being stripped away by this Supreme Court. We also know that Congress will have big foreign policy decisions not only in the days and weeks and months ahead, but probably in the years ahead. 
as we deal with what's happening with Ukraine, as we become increasingly polarized and globalized at the same time. I've worked overseas with the International Committee of the Red Cross, also working to promote human rights. But perhaps most importantly, and I share this in closing with a lot of humility and civility, I am proud to be a daughter of Vermont, born and raised on a farm in Orange County, um, a person who has gone through our education system and has committed her career, my career, to service. And I look forward to serving with your support and your vote as your first Congresswoman. Thank you. Liam? I am an independent, and I believe both sides of the political spectrum have values that are important to a healthy society. From the right, I think personal responsibility helps to create a society that flourishes. And from the left, I fully embrace that we as individuals grow from the soil of our community, and we need that community mindset. And we, in short, need both strong individuals and nurturing communities. I've also heard that, have you guys heard this expression, the definition of insanity is to try the same thing over and over and expect different results? What about this as a definition of insanity? Some of the things that are the unspoken agreements between the Democratic and the Republican Party. Endless funding for the war machine, um, keeping billionaire control and, uh, and ownership over our political media complex, and blaming all their failures on the other side and making demons and caricatures. The reason I'm running is because I have two little kiddos and I have deep love for the promise of their future. And I don't think that we can fulfill that potential until we recognize that the insanity of trying the same thing over and over and sending people to Congress who are just changing the players and changing the players and changing the players without changing the rules of the game. So I honor this, lots of the experience of our, our esteemed, uh, my esteemed panelists, but is it the experience of a doctor who would just prescribe the same tools that are proven not to work, a Band-Aid for a gushing wound? Is that what we want? Is it experience or is it vision and innovation? In Proverbs they say, without vision, the people perish. So I want to ask us, how many more elections are we going to send a safe bet? Are, are we going to expect, we'll do something visionary, we'll shoot for real change in the future, and I don't think we have many more elections to do that. Thank you all. Uh, please join me in thanking the four candidates who came this evening. I really mean that. It was really ter a terrific yeah. evening. And uh, travel well wherever you're going next. Thanks. And Thank you. Uh, good luck on August 9th. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.